intriguing. We've had a, a few coaches on before that were lawyers, and John Cooper was a former lawyer. So uh, go ahead, Matt. The stage is yours. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Appreciate the uh, the intros. And uh, um, like you mentioned, I'm thrilled to be on here. I actually um, reconnected with Wally a few weeks back, was able to get onto one of these sessions, and then uh, things opened up for us. And we happened to have a few practices Thursday morning. So I had to miss those, unfortunately. But uh, silver lining to, to Ontario getting a little bit more locked down right now is that I can hopefully join a few more of these. So yeah. Um, yeah, appreciate reconnecting with you, Wally, and uh, the invite to this and meeting all of you. And I know that there's others that come on the call as well. And uh, like I think like all of you, I'm I'm a sponge. I uh, I want to hear other thoughts and perspectives and people pick a, pick apart my perspectives, maybe. And um, I think this is a great, uh, great idea. So um so I'll, I'll, and I've got to jump off at 1130. I apologize, but uh, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of an idea. I mean, nobody wants to hear a lawyer talk too long, but I'll give you a bit of an idea of my, my path to where I am. And I think it's a unique one. Um, I, I don't know if it could have possibly led me to anywhere else, but coaching the women's team at, at, at Queens. Um, uh, so, and, and I agree. I think uh, John Cooper um, is a good sort of example of someone I think who did something a little bit similar. Obviously I have far fewer NHL wins and Stanley cups than he does, but, uh, the, uh, the connections are sort of similar. I think I've also had a few, uh, internet issues this week. So Wally, just let me know if, if I end up cutting out or pausing or freezing, just, just give me some sort of a heads up. Um, so I came from uh, Pembroke, Ontario, so a small Northern Ontario, type town, um, played a lot of hockey. As Wally mentioned, my father was, uh, was my coach for a lot of the minor hockey. Um, and I think his approach to, to coaching left a pretty good imprint on me as a, as a future coach and as a player as well. Um, I went to, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I started coaching actually when I was 17. And so, uh, we had a female high school hockey team and nobody wanted to coach it. So I actually, as a when I was in grade 12, I coached that team, which was my first sort of foray into it and, and really enjoyed it. Um, I went to uh, university in Ottawa uh, for my undergrad and, um, and made their varsity team. Um, at the time, though, I realized I wasn't going to play pro. Uh, the way I describe it is my mind always knew what I wanted to do, but my hands and my feet didn't quite catch up to what my brain wanted you know, myself to do. So I was sort of a third line left winger type. Um, and, uh, you know, the coach at the time, a great, great hockey guy. Um, but it was a little bit more hockey focused, uh, less school focused. And I realized that I wasn't going to make a career playing hockey. So I left the varsity team through the first year and, uh, but didn't want to give up hockey. And so I immediately started coaching. And, uh, so I was 19 and, uh, um, I was just coaching house league and, and they decided to give the new coach, um, all of the females that were, because there was no, this is 1990, 91 now, and there wasn't a dedicated league at that point. Um, so, uh, and, and I really enjoyed that. And I, and I found right away that, that two things, one, I thought that, that my personality and temperament fit sort of communicating with them, which was great. Um, but also they had no preconceived notions of, of the game. Um, and, and really that, then their parents were just happy that they were playing and I had my own sort of thoughts on on hockey and how to coach. And um, it was the perfect sort of blank canvas for me to try to try out some of those ideas and theories uh, risk free. So none of these athletes, um, you know, had had, you know, I don't know, the, the sort of the, the, the structured coaching that you might have in the 80s and, and, and how there might have been a lot of sort of yelling and and different types of motivation, I suppose. And I, I tried a different approach and, and it actually went really well. And it, um, I think kept the players engaged, but, um, but it also, um, kept me involved and, and interested. Um, I, at that point I had no intention or thought that I would actually make a career out of it at the end of the day. So continued in university, uh, got into law school at Queens. So we're into 94 to about 97 now. Um, and, uh, um, and then kept coaching throughout. 
Um, I practiced law from 99 to about 2012. Um, I was primarily a litigation lawyer, so I was in court quite a bit. Um, did civil litigation, criminal litigation, family law, basically anything that came in the door that got me into court. And, um, you know, I, obviously at law school, um, there's a lot of courses you take, uh, uh, on becoming a lawyer and, and the, uh, aspects of the job that, that are important for that. Um, um, and then, you know, living that for another 12 years afterwards. So, uh, there's a lot of courses that I've taken in HP one and HP two, that might last a couple hours on uh, certain topics that I basically lived for about 15 plus years. Um, so uh, in the summer of 06, I started as an assistant coach with the Queens women's team um, and was there for about three years as an assistant coach, still practicing law. In the summer of 09, uh, the then head coach in the Queens um, athletic department parted ways late in the summer so the athletic director approached me and said, look, it's too late for us to do a big search. Um, do you mind just sort of, you know, stewarding the team for a year while we figure this out? The, you know the players and they know you and, and uh, we'll, we'll figure it out a year later. So I said, fine. Um, and uh, we had the most wins in program history that year. And um, so they came back to me the summer afterward and said, well, do you want to come back for one more year? And it was pretty busy, obviously still having a full-time practice, but I really enjoyed it. Um, and um, much like my experience of, you know, 15 years earlier with House League and and uh, trying something new. And um, and then the following year, that second year, we won the OUA championship and won a bronze at Nationals. And so that next summer, uh, Queens asked me if I wanted to do this full-time. And... Uh, um, obviously with the support of, uh, my wife, uh, it, it was something I was feeling a lot more passionate about, um, versus the law and, uh, became full-time coach in 2011. And here we are 10 years later. So I've been a head coach for, uh, head coach of the team for 12 years. Um, back to Wally's point about being a lawyer. I think, I think, I think the training I received and experience I received as a lawyer really allowed me to seamlessly move in. Um, so I already had a bit of the hockey um, experience, um, my own thought process on on uh, 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 what I thought was a good coaching style, um, but a lot of transferable skills, um, I think, made the transition to being a head coach at a, at a high performance program a lot easier. Um, things like ethics, and I know that's uh, kind of a tongue in cheek joke when you're talking about lawyers, but um, I mean, the the number one um, perspective, I guess, that I wanted to take with the program is to really run it professionally. I mean, being a lawyer is a professional occupation, and and that's the that's the attitude that I wanted to take. And so everything I wanted to do was was to be done professionally. And so ethics plays a big big part of that. Um, your reputation is is really on the line here with this with this type of a job. Um, issues such as confidentiality, privacy. Uh, trust, uh, all big buzzwords, being a lawyer and, and ones that I was e easily able to bring over to, to being a coach. Uh, communication was a big, big part of it. Um, so all aspects of it. So so how I'm communicating with the athletes, I wanted to obviously take a professional approach. Uh, so the language I used or didn't use um, was, was important. Um, where and when to talk to the athletes. I mean, I was doing um, you know, rule of two type stuff 10 years ago. Um, you know, keeping a record of my conversations with the athletes, how I'm communicating through email in a professional way. Um, and then, you know, after a tough talk, following that up with a follow-up email. So there's records of everything. Um, certainly had, uh, you know, I, I, many times as a lawyer, I was in a meeting with a client and giving them some tough news. And we're talking serious you know, you're probably going to jail or going to lose your kids type news. And so certainly had experience with dealing and talking to people about tough, uh, tough topics. So when it comes time to having to release players, um, change roles, that sort of thing, I, I think I certainly had a pretty good background in, in trying to manage uh, those types of situations. Um, I think the communication piece also extends to referees. Um, you know, I spent years in front of judges 
the ones that are making the decisions. And, um, you know, I learned to, to advocate my position or my client's position before a judge. And, and I look at my role with referees to be the exact same. And um, so I don't scream and yell at refs. I'm proud to say in 12 years, I've never taken a bench minor penalty. Um, I've had a few refs look at me with, you know, eyebrows up and let me know that I had reached the, the threshold. But um, I prefer to talk to refs in between periods and make an argument to them and, and uh, um, try to work it out that way. Right. So I think, and, and that's how I'm, I, I want my players to react as well. So um, preparation is huge. Right. And I, I look at um, our preparation and my preparation for the weekend games, much like I was preparing for a trial. So, um, and just like uh, in hockey, I mean, uh, I felt most confident going into a trial when I had prepared the crap out of it. And, uh, and I was ready for as many, um, you know, different things as possible. Um, so, uh, I already had that as, as a, as a habit, I suppose, uh, planning, certainly a lot of experience planning a busy schedule, um, experience with handling budgets, experience with handling staff, um, professional development, obviously a big thing for lawyers and, and remains a big thing for me as well. And that, that, that mindset directly got me in line with, uh, with Wally and, um, and that was that was a huge experience for me. I was so happy that Queens obviously agreed to uh, that proposal. I was so happy that Wally agreed to that proposal and to fly out to Kingston and uh, and spend a week, um, you know, sort of shadowing and and talking through hockey. And that 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 still remains one of the highlights of my professional you know development career. Um, you know, advocacy, right? Just just advocating uh, a position of my own, of the teams, of the players, whether it be advocating up. Uh, to my department um, or advocating something to the players uh, or within U Sports or the OUA. Uh, I've been in part of a lot of boards and committees and president to the Coaches Association. So I think those skills did me well there. Um, and then also just marketing, right? And when I was a, when I was a lawyer, um, there was also a certain amount of uh, marketing that goes on. And um, I think that's also helped me a little bit when I'm you know, when I'm looking at recruiting into Queens, um, on the ice, uh, learned how to be analytical as a lawyer, um, learned to think outside the box, uh, look for gray areas and, and see what, uh, what we can use tactically to, to gain an advantage. Um, on the flip side, I also learned to be, um, I, I think calm under stress, um, and, and, uh, deal with, uh, um, again, highly, emotional sort of situations in a, in a very rational and calm way. Um, also learn to be quick on my feet. I mean, there's uh, countless times in a trial when things went sideways or you'd get an answer from a witness you weren't expecting and, uh, and you had to then just throw out your plans a little bit and, and start to make it up on the fly. And so um, we go into every game prepared, but I'm also prepared to, to change things quickly on my feet and, and adapt. Um, learned how to be resilient. I lost a lot of trials. I had clients, uh, I'm not saying I was an awful lawyer, but I certainly had clients go to jail. I had clients lose their kids and, and, uh, I, I believe I won more than I lost, but, um, those are some emotional situations. And, uh, and I was, I was in my late twenties at the time. So, um, certainly learned to be resilient and, and be able to bounce back from, from those types of scenarios. Um, and then public speaking. Um, I was on my feet. I was making complex arguments to judges. Um, and so, you know, those, those pregame talks, those locker room in between period talks, um, other, other situations, uh, perfectly at ease, um, you know, talking to people and particularly in situations that might be, uh, might be a little bit stressful or emotional. Um, just overall, I think, I mean, I hope a good work ethic, uh, accountability, good attitude. I mean, I, I got those all from, from being a lawyer as well. And again, all those just, just carried through. So I think, um, again, a lot of those things that I just said, uh, I've been to the, you know, a lot of the coaches clinics and, and, uh, I've seen a lot of them try to, you know, zip through those topics in an hour or two. And, um, but having lived it, um, and, and I, I took the long way around, obviously I wouldn't recommend that anyone, just for those characteristics, go to law school and then practice for 12 years. But 
it, it, it was immensely, immensely, immensely beneficial when I became a head coach that I had 15 years of education, experience and training um, in those areas, uh, because obviously it's, it's important what happens on the ice. Um, but, um, I, you know, I think that those areas are, are critical pieces of being a successful coach. And, and I was very thankful that, that I could just move in. So yeah, those things just carried, carried over. I think the, the one thing that, that failed to carry over from being a lawyer was the paycheck. And that was, uh, that was about it. But as I mentioned earlier, um, I never once, not once woke up in my 12 years of practicing law, jumped out of bed and, and rubbed my hands together and went, I can't wait to practice law today. And, and, uh, there were a lot of rewarding parts to it. I helped a lot of people. Um, but the, the first day that I, that I became head coach, um, it was a game changer and the, the passion was, was ignited and, uh, and, and hasn't subsided. And, um, so the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, there's aspects of the law that I miss, but honestly, the aspects of the law that I enjoyed the most are exactly the same reasons I coach in, in the sense that the, the competitiveness, the preparing for a trial, um, helping others out, um, those, those things I'm still doing. I don't, I don't miss the law because the areas of the law that I enjoyed the most, I'm still doing just in a different, a different courtroom as it were. So, um, 